Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we will begin in just a few minutes as soon as the attendees are joined. Good morning, everyone. We'll begin in just a minute as soon as all of the attendees are admitted. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, Angela. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the 83rd meeting of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Review Committee. My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the designated federal official to the Review Committee. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. The recording, transcripts, and meeting minutes will be made publicly available after this meeting, and will include the names of all those in attendance on today's call. If you object to this, you may disconnect at this time. This is a public meeting of the Federal Advisory Committee established by the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA of 1990. And this meeting is held under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, and its implementing regulations. This meeting was noticed in the Federal Register on November 28, 2022. An agenda for this meeting and materials are posted on the NAGPRA program's events page. The Secretary of the Interior issued a charter for this review committee, which governs its objectives and scope of activities. The purpose of the review committee is to monitor and review the inventory and identification process and repatriation activities under sections five, six, and seven of the act. The review committee is also responsible for reporting to Congress on the progress and any barriers encountered in carrying out its responsibilities. The Secretary of the Interior is responsible for appointing members to the review committee. I would like to welcome Armand Menthorn, who was reappointed by Secretary Holland on October 7th, 2022, and Holly Aloha Ayao, Dominique de Bobien, and Angela Garcia Lewis, who were all appointed by, the, by Secretary Holland on November 22nd, 2022. Currently, the review committee has six members. The charter for the review committee does not contain our quorum requirements, and a meeting may be held with fewer than seven members present. As the designated federal official, I've determined that this meeting can proceed with only six members. With that as introduction, I'd like to start with the roll call of committee members. Please answer out loud. Holly Aloha Ayao. Here. Dominique de Bobien. Here. Here. Angela Garcia Lewis. Here. Timothy McEwen. Here. Armand Menthorn. Here. Shelby Tisdale. Here. I would also like to acknowledge the individuals who are assisting me in conducting today's meeting. With me are two attorneys from the Department of the Interior's Office of the Solicitor, Brady Blasco with the Division of Parks and Wildlife, and Stephen Simpson with the Division on Indian Affairs. From the National NAGPRA program, Lisa Koshelski is the review committee coordinator responsible for organizing this meeting and preparing minutes and transcripts of these proceedings. I hereby call this meeting of the NAGPRA review committee to order. We'd like to start this meeting uh, with a traditional opening. Uh, Mr. Armand Benthorn has agreed to provide that opening. Armand? <clears throat> Kaichiyoyonawa <laughs> Imakas ki hanyo waton tamena imakas hani ki teloposa wam tain illa kawat kena wataspa. Today, as we come together, 
we thank our creator for our life, our family, and our friends. And we ask our creator today to give us strength and courage to go on and go forward. These past two years have been a test for all of us. In many places, we have empty chairs, we have empty rooms, but us, we're still here. And we ask our creator today <clears throat> to make our hearts big so that we can continue to help ourselves and continue to get strength to help one another. We ask Creator today to guide our thoughts and our words as we come together. And we give thanks today for another day. We give thanks for what we've done yesterday. And we ask Creator to grant us another day tomorrow. So these words to express and again, a thank you to all of you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you very much, Armand. Before we begin our first agenda item, I would like to note uh, for those in attendance that the review committee is interested in receiving comments from anyone in attendance on the progress made and any barriers encountered in implementing NAGPRA. If you're interested in providing a public comment during this meeting or at future meetings, please let me know when I ask for public comment. At that time, uh, you can uh, write in the chat uh, or you can raise your hand to request to make public comment. You may also email me to make your request at nagpra underscore info at nps.gov. Uh, to begin our meeting, the first item on the agenda is the selection of a chair and vice chair. Selection of a chair for this committee is required by the Act and the committee charter. Under current meeting procedures, the committee chair serves a term of two years with no limits on the number of terms. Under the meeting pr procedures that were adopted by this committee, the committee must also select a vice chair to serve in place of the chair when needed for the same two-year term. The designated federal official may also administratively oversee a meeting if necessary. How would the committee like to proceed? At this time, I'll turn the discussion of selection of a chair over to all of you. Um, please ensure that you identify yourself before you speak for those who are calling in and, and don't have the visual aid. Are, are we free? Uh, this is Holly Aloha. Are we free to nominate at this point? Uh, yes, sir. It's it's uh, up to the six of you to decide how to make this oh. select. Is, is that what we want to do next? This is Dominique. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good idea. Dominique, uh, I'm having trouble hearing you, Dominique. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Okay. Better. Sorry, I'm having technical troubles. It would seem. <laughs> No, but I think that sounds like a good idea, Holly Aloha. Then if that's agreeable with, with the rest of the, the members, I would like to nominate Dr. Tim McEwen to be chairman uh, of the review committee. Um, gee, thanks for that. I, it's an honor, um, but I respectfully decline. Um, as Melanie indicated, the terms for the chair and the vice chair for two years, I've still got 10 months left on my term as vice chair. I'm happy to continue in that role. Uh, but in the spirit of turnabout is fair play, um, I'll, I'll nominate you. <laughs> so there. <laughs> that did it turn out the way I thought. <laughs> Uh, 
this is this is Shelby. Um, I'd like to second um, Tim's nomination um, as well. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, Holly Aloha. Sorry. <laughs> Who calls the vote at this point? Um, I I would be happy to, to do that. Um, are there any other um, nominations or individuals who'd like to nominate themselves? Melanie, this is Armin. Yes, sir. Um, humbly, I would like to nominate myself for chair. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to serve as chair of the committee? Um, would you like to have any discussion on the question before we move to a vote? Um, I'll, um... I, I was thinking about the nomination of Hale Aloha. Um, I've known him a long time. Uh, and I respect the fact that, as he pointed out in previous uh, discussions we've had, he very much was in the room where it happened when NAGPRA was put together. And kind of thinking about his experience with this committee, uh, I realize he's probably appeared before the committee in various guises, uh, but mostly in terms of disputes more than anyone ever has. And I was, uh, the dispute with the Hearst, the dispute with Providence uh, twice, uh, two disputes with the Bishop Museum, one with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, so I, I also think it's important that we hand this off to the, to the new kids. I just want to say I was respectful. I believe each time I appeared before the committee and that happened many years ago. Okay, hey, right. is there any other discussion? Not at this time. Okay, uh, there are two members um, that have been nominated to be chair of the review committee, Armand Menthorn and Holly Aloha Ayao. Um, we can do uh, a, a voice vote. Um, for each of the two nominations. Um, I, I do ask that we do a voice vote just so it's easier to record in the record rather than a, a visual um, vote. So, um, I will start, I'm trying to work through how best to do this. Um, I, let's do it this way. Um, uh, for those who um, uh, vote for uh, Holly Aloha as chair, would you please raise your hand and then I will I will call your names. Do it that way. For Holly Aloha, we have Shelby Tisdale, Tim McEwen, and Angela Garcia Lewis. Okay, you may lower hands. And those who vote for Armand Menthorn, please raise your hand. <laughs> Dominique de Bobienne. Thank you. You may lower your hand. Okay, uh, with that vote, um, Holly Aloha. Ayao will be the chair of the NAGPRA Review Committee for the next two years.
May I say something? Yes, you may. So we have a seventh member who's to be named, uh, to be appointed by, by the secretary. Um, are we going to revisit this question when the seventh member joins so that that person also can be considered by the rest of the membership for, for leadership as chair? Um, well, in, in some ways that is up to you as the committee. Um, in your current meeting procedures, uh, require that you select a chair and that chair serves for a two-year term. Um, if the committee would like to alter those procedures, you may, you may do so, um, they are your procedures, um, but in, in the procedures as established, that would be the process. Then, then may I ask as my first official act that we consider doing so when the seventh member uh, joins us um, so that we are able to consider her or his leadership um, qualifications um, in terms of, of being chair if we could be mindful of that when the, when the seventh person joins. And the main reason I say that is because that person is, is supposed to be a religious leader. And in, in, in the work that I do, that's who leads us, is someone who's grounded in their spirituality. So, mahalo. Mr. Chair? Yes, yes. Wait, is that me? This is Angela Garcia Lewis, and I motion that we consider the uh, we reconsider and revote when a seventh member is appointed. Thank you. Um, we will be sure to make note of that for the committee. So at, at the time that the meeting is convened with that seventh member, we will we'll bring this issue forward to you again. Um. So uh, at this point, then, uh, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and that is you now, um, Holly Aloha, I will refer to you as Mr. Chair. Um, I will move on to this next agenda item. Thank you, please. Okay. The next two items on the agenda for today are a subcommittee discussion and a discussion of the report to Congress for fiscal year 2022. Under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, the Review Committee can use subcommittees to seek information and develop recommendations for the full Review Committee's discussion and consideration. Subcommittees can include non-members and can have non-public meetings, but cannot make recommendations directly to the Department of the Interior. Only to the full Review Committee can, can a subcommittee make recommendations. The Review Committee currently has one subcommittee on the annual report to Congress. At the last meeting of the Review Committee, subcommittee members Tim McEwen and Shelby Tisdale agreed to prepare and distribute a report to Congress, a draft report for fiscal year 2022. The subcommittee circulated a draft report prior to this meeting, copies of which are available in the meeting materials. At this time, it would be appropriate for the review committee to consider the membership of the subcommittee, discuss the subcommittee's draft report to Congress, and consider whether there are any tasks for the subcommittee ahead of your next meeting on January 10th. I'll turn this discussion over to the review committee and to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, if it pleases the, the, the committee, I would ask um, Dr. McEwen and, uh, is it Dr. Tisdale? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Who led the subcommittee on this issue? If they would please lead the discussion. Um, Shelby, do you want to go first, or I can? Why don't you go ahead and go first, Tim, and then I'll uh, I'll follow up. Okay. Um, the subcommittee on the report to Congress was established um, last year, sometime. The membership included. Uh, John Beaver, Honor Keeler, Barnaby Lewis, myself, Frank McManaman, and Shelby Tisdale. Um, at this juncture, many of those people have had their terms expire, so they're no longer members. Uh, there was discussion amongst us. Uh, there was a one particular section at the uh, one of the review committee meetings where 
everybody that was uh, their terms were about ready to expire mentioned things that they wanted to include in the report to Congress. Uh, and we used that as sort of the guidance of what we were going to put in it. Um, there's actually uh, several documents that I think are relevant here. There was a, a December the 15th version of the report uh, that is in the meeting's materials. And then there's a December 29th revision that was based on some other information that came in. And then there's an addendum uh, of additional items to be considered uh, that was put forth on January the 2nd of 2022. Um, the December 15th version has largely been uh, replaced by the 20 January 20 uh, December 29th version um, with the exception that there was an appendix on the first one that included uh, an extracted set of information from the program report with some edits on it so it's these three documents there's the December 29th version which is the text itself there's the appendix, which is from the December 15th version. And then there's the new information, new recommendations that were uh, submitted by uh, the chair, um, the now chair um, on January the 2nd. Shelby. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, I, I would like to um, just point out uh, that thanks to Tim, he really got the uh, draft started. <coughs> and I made some edits. And then, <coughs> excuse me, as he mentioned, we've we've had some additions. And so it's a, it's a work in progress. Excuse me. <coughs> I have my apologies for coughing here. It's a work in progress. And um, we look forward to hearing comments from other members of the committee. So I'll leave it there. Are there comments from the uh, from the other members? So are we? joining the subcommittee or can you clarify the action sure um no at, at this point um uh, you are reviewing the draft that was put together by the subcommittee and then as a committee you need to uh, review those recommendations discuss those recommendations and then as a group uh either uh, collectively accept those recommendations make changes to them um uh we can uh, the committee in the past has, has done this in a number of ways, um, going through each recommendation and, and doing a yes or no vote, uh, whether or not to include it, or um, uh, going through and accepting the entire report as drafted by the committee, the subcommittee. Are there any sections of the report that uh, any of the members find uh, concerning or um, would like to discuss with the rest of the community. This is Dominique. I, I did know have some concerns with some of the recommendations. Oh, I can I if, you, if you could, I can. Yes, and Dominique, I'm gonna ask you to speak loudly uh, as well as slowly because I think it's a connection issue. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, I can always switch back to my other computer. Um, I've had to switch around a little bit, but. I do still have some concerns with some of the recommendations that they may fall outside of our scope a little bit. And I, I sent out some suggestions last night that might be able to alleviate that issue because I do completely agree with the recommendations that are in there, but I do wanna make sure that we fall within the scope of our committee. So I was wondering you know, if we might be able to move some of those recommendations around so that they might fall under barriers um, which might make us a little bit more within that scope. Um, and then to take Armin's suggestion last night, which is to use some of those recommendations as more direct consultation um, line items with the secretary. 
so that they may not fall directly within this report, but we take them out and they are direct consultation items. Um, thank you, Dominique. Um, <clears throat> I like I like some of your uh, suggestions. Um, I think one of the ways we might want to look at this is um, since some of the recommendations are specific to recommendations that um, would require Congress to um, revisit the act. Um, it has been 30 years and as, as um, Holly Aloha has pointed out, um, things have changed a lot in Hawaii um, and, and in terms of what the act says versus what's actually happening on the ground as far as organizations and so on. And maybe um, taking, for example, I think you, you mentioned the civil penalties as being a barrier and we could put that list that as one of our barriers um, to, to completing repatriation, but also make a recommendation to Congress that there's more enforcement or, or um, an, and a review of, of really where we are in terms of museums and, and that that may be something uh, the GAO would do. So, you know, we may wanna, maybe that's one of the ways we could look at at um, our recommendations in particular and see what fit, might fit better under a barrier and then make a recommendation to Congress of how that could be um, rectified or somehow assist in the NAGPRA process. Definitely, because I think we're desperately overdue for a GAO review and mm -hmm. how we yeah. make that recommendation so it's heard the most effectively, I think is the challenge here. Mr. Chair. I guess the one comment I have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, a somewhere. question for Shelby and or Tim. Um, this report, is there a, um, a time frame on when this could be completed? Question. Um, the, re the review committee is required by statute to prepare a report. It doesn't specify how quickly that needs to be done. Uh, I know you had mentioned previously that there has been some issues of the committee completing the report to Congress and them not being sent timely. So that's a, a different issue. But I do think it's, uh, since we're reporting on a, on a fiscal year, um, which ended uh, at the end of September of 2022, uh, I think it's reasonable for us to try to get one in as soon as possible. Shelby? Yes, Mr. Minthorn. Um, like Tim was saying, um, you know, the sooner that this report is done, the better, because we have to get this on the table right. of Congress. So right. that not only do we have um, something written, but we need to have a capability that not only can the Congress refer to it, but we can refer to it. Right. And once a written record is done, then we have something in place. So it can't be emphasized enough, Shelby, that you know, the sooner that this report is done, the better. So, thank you. No, I I, think, oh, I agree. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes, same here. Uh, I just think two important points were made. One is that we we move uh, expeditiously to approve a version of this report, and two, if if it is the will of the committee that we uh, ask for a certain deadline by which it is submitted to the Congress. So in terms of, um, uh, I think Dominique's suggestion was to take some of the language from 
uh, the civil penalties in particular and to move that into the barriers part. But I think Shelby had also indicated, and I think you had as well, Dominique, that the idea of having GAO review this uh, was a good idea. So that would indeed be a recommendation. Yes. So I think to bifurcate that language is something that's just editorial things that we could easily do. Are there any other parts of the report uh, that uh, members want to recommend changes to or uh, wish to take up in discussion? Because I don't want to spend too much time here um, because as was pointed out to us yesterday, the bulk of our work is going to be in the proposed regulations. Right. Um, I have a question, uh, Melanie. Um, so at this point, um, do we want to add members to this subcommittee? I mean, right now it's it's kind of Tim and I. Um, it would be, I think, helpful to have other members be part of this subcommittee going forward. Um, well, at, at this point, um, if if you're looking at approving a report by, by your next meeting, January 10th. Uh, I think it's better if uh, all of you work together um, on, on drafting and, and editing and then bring that back um, in, in your next meeting. Uh, if you are projecting a longer period uh, for edits and work on this report, then yes, I think you would wanna add to the subcommittee. So I guess it has to go back to that question Armand asked about timing. If the committee's mm -hmm. goal is to approve a, a report at your next meeting, uh, then I don't see a need for subcommittees. Uh, but if if you're if you have a different goal, and and I will remind you that if you do have a different goal, you will not be able to finalize the report until you have another mm -hmm. meeting. Okay. I am in favor of the January 10th deadline and that we uh, please get our comments in to Tim and, and Shelby. I would also like to volunteer. Am I allowed to volunteer as a chair to sit on the subcommittee? I am, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But again, at this point, I think that I would encourage you to, um, to work on the draft as you have. Uh, you can exchange emails without being on the subcommittee. The, the committee okay. Oh, okay. Can, can okay. Yeah. Okay. Then, then I would encourage that that uh, because I really want to move on to the the, the regs um, that we please take a, a, a closer look. Uh, I think with with, with um, Armin's um, you know guidance in the back of your minds that we 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 need to finish this report and come to an agreement, preferably by the next meeting, and then. Uh, set a deadline by which we request that it be uh, forwarded to Congress um, and that we we not wait beyond January 10th. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll volunteer uh, with uh, Shelby's help uh, to kind of integrate the three different documents that we've got here uh, into one document. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Halleloha, I would suggest that we will take uh, sort of renumber things in terms of the recommendations so that the Hawaiian ones can be more into the flow and not an appendix at the end. Okay. And with That's following up on Dominique's idea to um, kind of bifurcate that civil penalties language, that'd be fine. I can, I can easily do that. Yeah, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, and, and, uh, the way I think we should proceed. Any other discussion on, on that in terms of how we're going to proceed? Is everyone clear to please get your comments in to, to Tim and, uh, sorry, Dr. McEwen and Dr. Tisdale? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm fine with that. Great. All right. Okay, good. Um, I just noticed in the text that there is a voice from the, the pre, from the, Committee of the past. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. comment there from Honor. Thanks, Honor. Yeah. 
All right. Are we are we good then with this um, with a plan forward and how we're going to address the the our comments to the report to Congress, and then have uh, Tim and Shelby compile everyone's uh, comments into a, a final version that we can uh, hopefully approve on the, I believe it's the January 10th meeting. Right. Melanie? Yes. All right, we're, we're good. Um, Melanie, can you, can you remind me what day of the week the 10th is? Um, certainly. Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, so if I get a revised draft to everyone on Sunday, is that okay? I'll try, I'll try quicker, but in terms of getting comments to me, I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to send me stuff. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That, Thank you, Shelby. And that's okay with your schedule, Shelby. I know that you're traveling. Uh, I'll be back Sunday night. Um, so I'll, I will um, look at it as soon as I get home. Okay. Okay, are we good with this? Um, any other uh, final comments before we move on in the agenda? Okay, having heard none, um, if we could move on to item four, proposed regulations discussion. And I would ask uh, Dr. McEwen if he could lead the discussion on this since he took the heroic um, position to compile a lot of our comments um, for, our, uh, for further consideration. Tim? If I might, just for the sake of the attendees, give a little bit of background on this. <clears throat> Hello, my, uh, please. Okay. Um, uh, on October 18, 2022, the Department of the Interior formally proposed to revise regulations to improve implementation of NAGPRA. The department is seeking public comment on the proposed rule through January 17, 2023. Information on submitting comments, as well as links to several documents that may assist in review of the proposed rule, are available on the regulations page of the NAGPRA website. I'll post a, a link in the chat. In addition, the department is seeking the review committee's recommendations regarding the proposed rule. The review committee has time today and on January 10th to develop its recommendations. Um, at this time, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the committee. Sorry. Um, actually, if I might, kind of segue into a slightly different issue. Um, Honor just mentioned to me that her comment um, that's in the text is not seen by the other participants. Do we need to read that in the record? Um, no, I will copy and paste it. Okay. Um, then um, Halela had asked me to kind of lead a discussion of this. I would like to propose, we actually have very little time that we can deal with this. Uh, I want to thank the committee members for sending their comments that I tried to put in some sort of order uh, that we could deal with them. Uh, Melanie has said that obviously we need to focus on trying to get something done by the 10th because the deadline for the uh, commenting on the proposed rule is, uh, is set by the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, what I would recommend is if we could do maybe an hour, just quickly go through the document to identify those sections, those comments that we have put forward that we have no issue with, that we all sort of agree on, and then take the rest of our time to circle back on those where there are multiple comments on the same section. Those are going to take some more work on our part. Does that seem like a reasonable way to proceed? Yes. So what I would recommend, not only for the committee members, but also for members of the public, is if you can pull down the uh, comments uh, from December 29, 2022, and I believe there's two versions of it in the folder. 
One of them has the initials at the end, um, A or E H A. That is the one to focus on. That's the most recent one. So if we can proceed, there's 29 pages. We're going to go fast. Uh, the first paragraph says overall the revised draft. Does anyone have an issue with this paragraph? No. Subpart A, general, 10.1, introduction. 10.1A, there are actually two, two different sets of comments on that section. Uh, I would recommend that we sideline that one for later discussion because we'll need to come up with a common opinion on that one. On page two, 10.1D, duty of care. There's actually three comments on that section. That's gonna take some work on our part. So I would suggest that we come back right. to that. Uh, 10.1H, there's only one comment on that. Does anyone have an issue with that comment? This is actually a comment that was submitted by the committee last year on the draft proposed rule. No, no comment. I mean, uh, support rather. Uh, 10.2, definitions of this part. 10.2, uh, acknowledged Aboriginal land issues. 10.2, Ahukua'a issues from the committee. 10.2, ARPA Indian lands and the following one, 10.2, ARPA Indian lands and ARPA public lands. Um, there are two separate comments on that. I suggest that we need to circle back on that to reconcile. 10.2 consultation, one, two, three. There's three different comments on that. I think we'll need to reconcile those. 10.2 cultural item. There's one comment on that. Are there any comments on that? Concerns about that one? 10.2 disposition statement. Agreed. 10.2 holdings or collection. Ten point two Hui Malami Inakupuna or Hawa Ine. Comments on that or concerns about that one? 10.2, Hui Iwi Kuamoko. 10 point, uh, now we're on page five, 10.2, human remains, one, two, there's two separate comments on that. They're quite lengthy. I think we'll need to spend some time on that. On page six, 10.2, Native American, comments on that or concerns about that one? Uh, yes. There are concerns? Yes. This is the comment regarding non-recognized tribes. So. Yes, I believe. Yes. Right, Dominique? Is that, I think that's one of yours. Yes, it is. Okay, so we can circle back on that. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, 10.2, we're on page six, 10.2, Native Hawaiian Organization. This one is quite lengthy. Um, it goes. All right. <laughs> it goes to page eleven. Are there concerns about that? On page <clears throat> on page eleven, ten point two. Oh, please. Just interrupt for a minute. I'm I'm going to turn off my camera um, so I can and let you all work. I'm still here if you need me and if if you have a question. I will pop back on. I just wanted everybody to know why I was turning off my camera so that as you work through these. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on page 11, 
10.2, Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Is there concern about that section? Uh, page 12, 10.2, Ohana. Concerns about that one? Uh, 10.2, possession or control. Are there concerns about that? Um, while no one has expressed, expressed concern, since I've introduced that one, I think we should talk about this. So I'm going to highlight Reconcile that. Them. I was going to say, yeah, I have additional comments on that as well. Okay. Cool. Um, on page 12, 10.2, repatriation statement. Ten point two right of possession. Ten point on page thirteen, ten point two sacred object. I have additional comments to that one. Okay. Um ten point three cultural and geographical affiliation. Ten point three cultural and geographical affiliation. No. Those are good. Mm -hmm. uh, 10.3A, revised statement of cultural affiliation. H14, 10.3B, C, and D. On to page 15. Um, subpart B, 10.4 general. 10.4 A, 10.4 general, um, these are different ones I think that um, uh, Dominique brought in. Are there issues with any of those? No. Ten, uh, on page 16, 10.5 discovery. Table one of 10.5, are there issues with that? No. 10.5C. 10 uh, and then there's a second paragraph, there is also an important requirement. On page 17, 10.5C, respond to discovery. Oh, um, this one, 10.5C, and then the following one, 10.5C, 10.6A, 10.7C. I think these are cover different as aspects, so I suspect we should probably want to talk about that. Uh, 10, 17 at the bottom, 10.5 C3 discoveries on DHHL lands. Page 18, 10.6 excavation. NAGPRA states that. Ten point six A excavation on DHHL lands. 10.7, disposition. 10.7B and 10.7C. 10 on page 19, 10.7C on tribal lands. 10.7E2A, strongly object. 20 uh, subpart C the goal of Nagra is um, next paragraph given the new geographical affiliation Constitution requires access to. 
estimates provided in the response to on page 21 without a reasonable infusion of funding Excellent. Uh, 10.8 general subsection 10.8 C. Uh, there's actually two different ones here, so we'll probably need to reconcile these. Bottom of that page, 10.8 D. Yeah, good. Uh, 22. One critical element of the act. Uh, 10.9 B step two. It's 23, 10.9 B three. Uh, subsection 10.9 I3. So, sorry, uh, I think in 10.9 B3, she's requesting clarification. So should we discuss that? Sure. Um, subsection 10.9 I3. Ten point nine I three, ten point ten J three. Ten point ten, the steps are clear. Uh, ten point ten B three. Subsection ten point ten C four. Uh, ten point ten D six, we're on page twenty four. Ten point ten K, ten point ten K, is that a B? We can check the reference to it. Uh, 10.11 civil penalties, uh, 10. I'm sorry, could we, oh. could we for 10.10 KB, could we uh, circle back to, to okay. discuss that one? It was a similar uh, concern with the definition for uh, Native American. The issue was um, non-fairly recognized threat. Okay, um, I've marked that as circle back. Uh, 10.11 civil penalties. We need to go through that again. Which one? What more comment on this one? More discussion? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 10.11 A1. Ten point eleven. Oops, there's two of those. Um, I think we agree, though. Okay. 10.11, we're on page 25. 10.11B. 10.11B2. 10.11G4. 're on page 26 uh, subsection 10.12 a 10.12 b1 on page 27 one issue that is not addressed. On page 28, um, whether the collection of information. Um, 
the uh, B, the accuracy of the estimate. C, ways to enhance the quality, utility, and clarity. And D, how the agency might minimize the burden. Um, I put this one in, everybody seems okay with it, but I would like to chat about this one. Obviously, I agree with this, but I think it would be good for us to discuss it. I'm sorry, Tim, which one? Uh, D at the end. Oh, gotcha. And that's it. Okay, circle back. So I've, I've, on my copy, I have marked all of the ones we had no concerns about. Um, in going forward with it, I suspect there may need to be some editing uh, in terms of sort of voice. Uh, I think some of these are in first person. Uh, and I think that they would need to be changed to we as the committee. But other than that, I think that's fine. Um, so, maybe it's time to take a break. <laughs> so I can sort of think about how to go through the ones that we've marked for discussion. Be before you take a break, um, Mr. Chair, can I, this is Stephen Simpson, may I ask for clarification on the process uh, please. you just went through. Um, when the committee, when uh, Tim was asking questions as to whether there were any requests for, for discussion of a particular item, and no one asked for it to be discussed. Does that mean that the committee is adopting that particular comment as its recommendation? Uh, great, great question. Um, I think for myself, the answer would be yes. Is that everyone else's uh, um, understanding? That we were flagging the, those issues that we believe required further uh, discussion amongst us so that we could reach agreement? Yes, I agree with that. I think that we should allow for um, any additional comment next time. On, if you find something that you, yeah. you know, need to address for the next meeting. Yeah, and I think um, I think some of the areas we've already accepted. There, there might be some minor typos and things like that that just need to be cleaned up and and maybe collapsing some of the uh, comments, but I think, I think we're, uh, my feeling is we pretty much have agreed on the, the different topics that um, uh, we don't need to further discuss. I would say yes, I, I, there's significant public comment that might, you know, sway opinions either uh, way. So we yeah. should maybe keep that opportunity open, but overall, I would say that yes, we would be in agreement yeah. on those right. Excellent recognition, Mahalo. Uh, Armin, is that your understanding as well? Armin, is that your understanding as well that what we uh, didn't discuss was in agreement? Can, can you hear me? Um, you might be frozen. Uh, my picture looks frozen too. Yeah. I wonder if his I connection is. Frozen. Oh, shucks. Uh, oh, no, no. He's moving. <laughs> Maybe he just can't hear me. Aaron, can you hear me? I think he is frozen. Uh, Melanie, any, uh, how, how should we proceed? I want to make sure we all agree because uh, uh, Stephen raises a very important point. Um, 
in terms of how we are reaching consensus on this. So I want to make sure that we are all in agreement on how we're proceeding. Certainly. Um, Armand, can you hear us? I can hear you now. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> is, is it your understanding and an agreement that those issues that we did not discuss is because we did not have concerns and we're supporting it? Yes. Okay, so I think that's that's all of us. So, so that, that to answer your question, Stephen, it's yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, um, yeah, that sort, of, that sort of gave me a minute to start kind of think about how best to proceed. Um, we certainly can take a break, but the alternative is to just keep on going, start at the beginning and move on. I, I would recommend that just given the short period of time that we have. And since I, I woke up at five um, uh, and I've had a lot of coffee, <laughs> I say we have a little more, which is our word for move on. Um, unless someone really needs to uh, take a break, you know, in terms of going to the bathroom. Um, otherwise, let's proceed. Um, All right, Dr. Michel. Uh, perhaps we can just start at the beginning and work our way through then. Um, Is it 10.1D, the first one? Uh, I think the first one for discussion was, um, and correct me, uh, under on first page, 10.1a, there were two separate sections, oh, yeah. different alternative yes, uh, yes. comments on that. Um, I introduced the second one, uh, which the, as an explanation, the committee had previously commented on the draft proposal and the text that is written here uh, at the top on, this is page two, under purpose, that is the text that the committee recommended last year. Obviously, the additional text that is in that section uh, at the bottom was what the department put in. And I have no problem with that. I just want to make a distinction between what Congress said the purpose of the statute was and what the regulations kind of interpret that to mean. So that's why I bifurcated that into two sections. I don't think we lose anything, but it does make the clear the point that this committee has previously made that we need to stick with what the statute says as well. Comments? Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm asking uh, members for comments. That makes sense to me. Um, since the alternative, the other set comment on that section was from um, Shelby, do you have anything that I you would like to tinker with in terms of these two to sort of reconcile them? I think one of the, the things that, that we do want to express is is our support for the additional um, information that was put in the purpose, um, especially in that uh, the requirement that museums and federal agencies defer to the customs, traditions, and Native American traditional knowledge of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, and the Native Hawaiian organizations. Because this is, this is something that has been brought up uh, throughout committee meetings, as well as from um, tribes, uh, the sensitivity of this traditional information and being protected from FOIA. So I think, you know, having some sort of comment about that and that we support that. And then, um, and then also, I think your, your information uh, reflecting the, the act itself and, and the purpose um, is important. So I think having, you know, letting um, 
at least saying, you know, part of this we support, and then this is how we feel it really needs to be stated in other areas of the purpose. I agree. I think that is important to underline that as, you know, something that really needs to happen in terms of consultation and dealing with agencies, because a lot of times they they tend to be very um, restrictive to the language of the the regulations and say, well, it doesn't say that. Right. So I would like to ensure that that remains within. Um, Shelby, would you be amenable to me um, trying to fold your comment into my comment? To yes. Kind of retain that text, but have as one. Yeah, and you could take out some of the other part of it as an explanation of why it's important but um but i i think it is really critical that that it be in here somewhere i'm i'm happy to do that and you and i can chat about it whether yeah it, it meets your concerns okay that sounds good thanks tim okay i, I think it's important though to leave in the language of the why yeah yeah uh, i i think that's critical for Mm. reader to understand why we're, we're taking that position so if you leave that part in because i think that was very helpful okay okay i'll take a whack at that i would like okay. to also include transparency as yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice say that again angela transparency as a you know a goal and objective within the the regulations. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if the committee is okay, I'll I'll take a whack at coming up with some revised text that combines those and adds Angela Angela's concern. Sounds good. Yes. Uh, moving on to page two, ten point one D, duty of care. Mm. I don't think these are in conflict with each other, but there's three of them. So I just wanted to make sure we're okay with some way of combining that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, Shall I take a whack at that too and see if everybody's satisfied next week? Please. please. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yes, okay. thank you. Uh, on page three, uh, ARPA Indian lands, ARPA Indian lands, and ARPA public lands. Or did we agree to those now that I? No, we asked to reconcile because there's yeah. two 10.2 uh, comments. Yeah. Dominique and myself. I just require or requested clarification of what exactly that change was was addressing because I was I was just not clear on that. Um, I, this may be a question for the solicitors then. Well, I'll go ahead and take a stab at it, and they can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, those definitions, ARPA Indian lands and ARPA public lands, are drawn directly from ARPA. And the intent of those definitions, taken from uh, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act itself, is to uh, address a definition of where a permit under ARPA is required on tribal lands. So tribal lands under NAGPRA is within the exterior boundaries of a reservation, which is not the same as ARPA Indian lands and ARPA public lands. And so we have tried to use those two terms to clarify when a permit under ARPA will be required. That is the sole use of those two definitions. Okay. Um, even though NAGPRA says that ARPA permits are required for any excavation, uh, on lands within the exterior boundary, which is newer and more specific 
than what ARPA said. Is that not correct? That is that is not our interpretation of NAGPRA. Um, and and the um, the point that Melanie made about these two definitions being coming directly from ARPA is the answer to um, also to the comment about individual Indians. Um, that also comes directly from ARPA. And by the way, the term individual Indians is not identified is not defined in ARPA. <laughs> but that's why we use that term rather than none of the sentence. Hmm. Okay. I think if you're using that term, you need to define it. Yeah. And you can leave that comment, that portion of the comment in. Um, and let me ask. Let me ask a question. My understanding, my read of the Section Three requirements in terms of excavations and discoveries on private lands within the exterior boundary of an Indian reservation is that uh, essentially NAGPRA preempts applicability of state law on those lands, consistent with the uh, arguments for a nearly identical definition that was litigated in. Uh, state of Oklahoma versus DOI. Is that not correct? The, the federal law generally generally preempts state law. Hmm. And in, in this particular case, for the, uh, an identical definition about yes. ex within the exterior boundary, so that on private lands within the exterior boundary of an Indian reservation, State law doesn't apply in terms of excavations and discoveries because it's preempted. And to the extent that the state law conflicts with, with the federal law, yes, it would be preempted. And NAGPRA says that on those Indian on those tribal lands, you cannot proceed with uh, activities in the vicinity of a discovery without an ARPA permit. You can't do the excavation without an ARPA permit. The and what, is, that, what this reads like to me is you're setting up a situation where without the ARPA permit, they will not be able to excavate those remains because they don't have a permit as required by NAGPRA, an ARPA permit. And that I think would clearly be a taking of the otherwise legal use of their private land. As we've noted in the preamble to the proposed regulations, um, and then and in response to tribal comments, that's also on the website, um, we disagree with that interpretation of NAGPRA as far as the application of ARPA to private land within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. You're welcome to come put it in the comment and we will we will look at it again. Hmm. I suspect this one will need more discussion. Yeah. I think so. I think we need to know who um, issues those permits and how, whether or not that would impede tribes from repatriation. I've never seen it happen, but I don't know how that is with other tribes. Hmm. Shall we sideline that one again and move on to see yeah. if there's yes, more that please. we can resolve? No. 10.2 uh, consultation, there's three different versions of this. Um, my first one, basically I support it. So that's not a problem. Um, I think uh, Dominique raises the issue of between equal parties. And I'll let you explain yours, Eddie.
Well, I, I like uh, Dominique's um, mm -hmm. recommendation um, in terms of the additional language. You know, we, we've all been through this and, and sometimes we take things for granted and, and having it in writing and, and explicit is important. So that, that the idea that we're equals shouldn't be assumed. <laughs> And then if it's expressed and explicit, then, then the agency, the person you're sitting across the table from is clear that um, this is not top down. This is uh, two equal parties discussing very serious issues and trying to reach agreement. So I, I completely support that, that, that uh, additional language. Mm -hmm. And looking at it a little closer, um, I see I, I've supported it and you've sort of supported it too. I think the change is about the between equal parties. Can we agree to add that in? Right. I think we also need to identify who those parties are during consultation so that we know who is making the determination on as a tribe um, who needs to be addressed in the consultation because a lot of times they will have uh, staff do the entire consultation and the person that makes the determination is not there throughout the entire process. So I would like to know specifically who that person is in consultation. That needs to be clarified from the beginning. Excellent point, Angela. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a really good point. And something I've seen in other documents that we've put in is that we request that the decision makers be present during consultation. Is that language that people might be amenable to? Mm -hmm. um, could I ask you, Dominique, if you could take a crack at, at synthesizing those three definitions into one? Sure, no problem. Right. Okay. Uh, so I'm on page five. Yeah, human remains. Okay. Um, let me skip to the end. I, I'll explain mine. You explain yours, okay, Eddie? Um, okay. Uh, 10.5, there's one clause in the regulations that's been in there a long time that says um, it exempts from including in an inventory human remains, quote, that may reasonably be determined to have been freely given or naturally shed by the individual from whose body they were obtained. My problem with that is that it basically allows the museum or federal agency to make that decision before the consultation happens, before the inventory is done. And that whole issue about freely obtained or naturally shed actually speaks to the issue of right of possession, which under the statute happens after the inventory is done. So I would recommend deleting that clause entirely and basically allow it to work that way, that the museums or federal agencies would be required to include any and all human remains in their inventory. And that after the fact, after that is done, then in the consultation with the tribes, they can determine whether in fact they do have right of possession. And clearly, in that situation, the burden to show they have right of possession is on the museum. And that's the proper I, way to do it, I think, under the statute. I agree. I, I, yeah, I do too. I really support that, that logic. Oh my goodness, you would have made a great chairman. <laughs> but I, I approached it from the cultural perspective. <laughs> but I should have approached it from the procedural um, perspective in terms of what was the, uh, the, the consultation. Because you're right, if you leave this in, they pre-screen it. 
So you won't even know that the, that the museum has right. such an object. And I think that's the yeah. critical concern. Right. Let and the process play itself out. It adds oh, a, go ahead. Sorry, a burden to the um, to the tribes as well, because you have to go back and in some cases um, consolidate those burials because of the right. exclusion. And Especially here in the southeast, ahead. where we have preservation issues, and where you know all that may be left preserved are those objects that are described as freely shed. You know that's a huge cultural divide, especially down here, because we would call that a burial, whereas the museum would call that, you know, a loose tooth. So, you know, there's a huge disagreement there, and and we would like to have that freedom to decide what is and what is not a human remain. You know, my, my concern was that human remains are human remains. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, if it was uh, incorporated into an item, it's the function of the item that's critically important. So if it was uh, an adornment for, uh, for a chief, if that item then gets taken, then that function has ceased. And the human remains have the right, like any other part of a person, to then be buried, but under this definition, that, that doesn't happen. And so that's why I, I've never um, agreed with that, uh, that, that distinction and would really like to see it removed, but really now for, for the, uh, based on the logic that, that, that Tim shared, because that should be part of the consultation. That should be part of the, the reaching of an agreement um, um, on the table for two equal parties to, to discuss. I, I, I really appreciate that, Tim. I have a comment. I'm not sure how to phrase it. That I, I wanted to talk with you guys more about that. Because from an Autumn perspective and from many other cultures, the issue with um, being identified as human has specific connotations in the spirit of the person, the creature. So we also include um, certain raptors, that sort of thing, certain faunal um, remains as human because they're imbued with the same spirit and we consider them to be human based on their uh, significance to the people and we kind of analogize that as um, infants also don't have the ability to communicate or you know and um very elderly people may not have the same abilities, but we still consider them to be human and valid and have place within the community. So um, we consider all of these to be human. And they're, um, the cultural the cultural definition of human and the biological definition of human are not the same in terms of um, coming from the tribes and coming from the agencies. Can we go back to the 10.2 at the top, your comment, Eddie? Um, when I, I just reread it again, the first part I think is similar to what I have just proposed. So I don't think there's any yeah. conflict there. Um, yes. The second part is about in, uh, expanding the definition of human remains to include casts and 3D scans. Um, yeah. I'm in favor. I support that. And I, I gave a real, uh, an example because we had no idea <laughs> So that, that was, the, that was the, the beauty of the last 30 years is 
we got to see it in action and then figured out which parts of this needed to be tweaked to address what was really happening on the ground. So we find out that remains that were repatriated to us from the San Diego Museum of Man prior to that, you know, it wasn't as if they were doing this because NAGPRA, but they had already been doing it, where they're allowing uh, uh, 3D scan, uh, casts to be made. And it was part of a company that they had, they were doing business with. And then that company was, was selling it online. And these include Native American remains. And so we addressed the company and asked them to remove all such remains from their website. And, and then realize that some of these were 3D scanned, which means it doesn't matter if they turn over the remains to you or the, 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 the facsimiles to you because they still have the data to recreate it. Yeah. So this is a very serious problem, especially for, so for us, the term ki'i means image, means picture. But if you can create something to entice the spirit of someone to inhabit it, you can control it. So this is no different than taking a picture of human remains. And that's why we've always opposed it. And that's why I felt compelled to, to address, you know, the, the need to expand the definition to include uh, scans and, and um, uh, casts. Uh, we're also learning in our work in, in uh, abroad that a lot of European museums have done the same. They, they've created casts of, of the remains um, just as a matter of practice. Mm. And, and for us, those have to be returned as well. So, you know, I would ask the committee to give this a serious consideration that if we're going to be complete in this work, that it has to include all images, especially ones that look, I mean, you couldn't tell the difference. They can color them as well to make them look as authentic as, as you can imagine. And, and I think we should address that uh, by expanding the definition. I support completely what you said, and I would actually go a step further and expand on it a little bit to include sensitive records like photographs, x-rays, and digital data that might be associated with human remains, but also sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony, which, um, you know, I've had some experience with museums, you know, dissecting some sacred objects and then having a record of that, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you can't undo that culturally. So for them to be able to retain a copy of that digitally is very problematic when it's supposed to be such private information. So I think if we could expand a little bit, you know, I would be in support of that. Oh, I support that too. Thank you, Dominique. I agree. Um, Dominique, you had said um, photographs, x-rays, what else? Reports. The digital information is important. Yeah. Yeah digital data and I would leave it a little bit open-ended because you know some tribes may be interested in it and some may not and I think there needs to be that consultation discussion on how that digital data is stored returned um, you know if tribes want that back to them during repatriation then it should be allowed or if they want it to just be completely deleted you know that should just be a consultation point I'll take a whack at it and I think um, I think Honor Keeler also suggested adding NFTs right. in the chat. DNA information that was obtained from human remains. Mm -hmm. um, define NFT. Yes, please. Non fungible tokens. Mm -hmm. um, Honor, if you could post what NFTs is in the chat, that'd be helpful to us. It is non-fungible tokens, ah. meaning it's digitally unique and can't be replaced. So it's basically... Um, selling the digital signature 
อืมอ everybody okay with that to yep. amend the, amend this one to include those things yes uh on to six 10.2 native american i think that though you had highlighted that yeah oh maybe Dominic, if you could just discuss what uh or share what uh, your comment because mine is more a cultural uh concern uh or just a comment really but if you could explain the, the comment sure so I've got some concerns about opening up NAGPRA to non-federally recognized tribes without defining what that process means. And my work is mostly focused in the Southeast, and I know that there's a huge difference between, you know, how state tribes work on the West Coast and how they work here on, on down in the Southeast. But, you know, we've got some concerns that maybe that process isn't very thoroughly vetted down here. And so leaving the door open when there isn't any sort of minimal standard that's outlined in the law might leave that door open for groups that are disingenuous and maybe not actually associated with those indigenous remains. That's the concern is that, um, and there's you know been a couple studies done about it. You can kind of look to Alabama, Florida, they're kind of the problem areas. Um, but we just wanna make sure that ancestors are going back to their actual ancestors and not to groups that are just finding loopholes in the law um, and taking possession of remains that aren't, aren't theirs. And so I think having a definition there would be beneficial. Um, and I also do wanna make sure that it is within the scope of the law to expand beyond federally recognized crimes you know, federal recognition is a burdensome process and that trust responsibility between tribes and the federal government is, is very important. So I would just kind of request a legal review there to make sure that it's in our scope to even make that recommendation. That makes sense to me. <laughs> um, I, I guess what I, I wanted to share, what I wanted to share was that, um, uh, if I may, that, you know, when I look at this work, in my mind, it's less about uh, political rights and legal rights as it is about cultural responsibility. And that um, knowing, you know, the discussions that took place in 1989, 1990, amongst McCain staff, Illinois staff, you know, the idea was to uh, I mean, that's why this is considered human rights legislation, is because it, it's recognizing the humanity um, of, of, of Native people. And so for me, to, to marginalize uh, uh, people because they don't have political recognition is a hard pill for me to swallow, because they still have cultural responsibilities to their ancestors. And, and they should be, they should have the ability um, to, to be placed into that position of, of responsibility because it is a position that, uh, well, it is an exercise that leads to healing. And healing, in my view, is the goal. Um, and so uh, perhaps language that, that doesn't prohibit a museum from on its own deciding to consult with a non-federally recognized tribe and allow them the humanity, the recognition of their humanity to return their ancestors. And, and, and you know, this whole notion of who owns them is, is very troublesome to me. And, and, and my answer to that is uh, Mother Earth owns them. Not a museum. Our ancestors didn't make for the purpose of creating archaeological material. They made it for, to have a loving family and that comes with sensitivities. And so for them to remain in the museum because of a political issue is it, it's tough. I, I I cannot wrap my head around that. So I just 
flag that just for, for the ability to share these comments and that any way that this committee can support those who are not able to use NAGPRA to, to exercise their Juliana, their, their, their duty and responsibility to their ancestors, if we could find some way to do so. I think that would make two, very, two senators who have since passed away very happy. <laughs> and that would be Senator Inouye and Senator McCain, um, because that's how they were thinking. Thank you. I think with um, the exclusion of non-federally recognized tribes, um, I agree with Dominique that there are issues with um, saying new age groups that would want to um, be recognized as having that sacred obligation without the um, actual affiliation with the people or without, um, you know, all of the cultural obligations that come with. And the institutions are not qualified to make that determination as to who makes, who has the, the cultural right to uh, assume those responsibilities. So I think that we could uh, leave it a little open-ended to include those people, but I believe that the, the federally recognized tribes should also have be consulted in that sense because a lot of the tribes know who their relatives are and uh. you know that sort of thing where they can... Um, attest to the fact that these these groups have they do have this responsibility and we concur that they should be repatriated to those individuals instead of allowing the institution to have the power to make that determination as to who repatriates because who's to say that they won't decide well you know we're going to hold off on repatriation because it may be that we can repatriate to another group in a sort of um, a tactic to delay repatriation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, this is Armand. Yes, sir. Um, you know, one of the I guess the bigger teachers for anyone, whether it's just work or even just day-to-day -day living, experience is the biggest teacher. And we've had experiences before with this committee. And um, if you could help me, Melanie, um, you know, every university, museum, federal agency, they're all bound by the law. And the NAGPRA law can be very specific on consultation. But the, again, this is where the federal agencies, they all have a responsibility to have consultation policies and many of them don't and many of them don't use that policy but again we have made repatriations in the past to federally recognized tribes for those tribes that aren't federally recognized and this is where partnership is key because those tribes and again specifically Melanie this was an experience that we went through with the state of Texas where there were tribes that 
could be affiliated or culturally affiliated with a set of human remains, ancestral remains. But this is where, again, it worked out very good because there were federally recognized tribes that acted on behalf of those other tribes. And it was a good working relationship. And this is where, again, tribes need to understand how important working with each other is. And that's just a recall, Melanie, in that um, the state of Texas where it all worked out in the end. So just that comment. Thank you. Mahalo. Um, I, I'm comfortable with with uh, with uh, Dominique's um, uh, comment in 10.2 Native American. Um, I, it's good to hear that cultural affiliation by federally recognized tribes for those that aren't recognized is supporting repatriation of those remains. That that really comforts me. Thank you. Onward. Please. Um, Native Hawaiian organization, I'm not going to mess with that. We've all agreed to that. Uh, if I might ask, um, Hale Aloha, if you could take a good look at that to see if you want to edit it in any way. Because that's a yeah, I'll take out the, uh, I'll take out the, um, the explanation. I'll, that was more for the lawyers. <laughs> um, but if we agree, <laughs> And I can take out Dr. Uh, Dr. Sai, he's my classmate. He's like an expert in this area. And he insisted that I <laughs> include his comments, but I'd be more than happy to take it out and streamline the, the, the comment. And if you could send me the revised text to that, I'll slide it in. Gotcha. Um, Possession and control. I think we had all talked about this and there were no objections to it. But since I put this in, this I think is actually a pretty significant proposal change. Um, the statute talks about requiring museums and federal agencies to do inventories and summaries on objects that are in their possession or control. And or is an important word that tells us that Congress thinks possession and control mean different things because they've connected them with an or. Um, the current, the uh, draft, the draft proposal from last year actually dropped possession entirely and replaced it with something called custody. And then there were some objections to that. The current one now provides, uh, defines possession or control as one thing, which I think is inconsistent with what the Congress proposed. But I think there's a solution to this, and that's to just take the definition of custody and call it possession. And to require museums and federal agencies to include in their summaries and inventories anything that they have control of, plus anything they have in their possession slash custody that they may not have control of. Not to include them in their inventory, but to provide that list to the Park Service and the Park Service would put it up on the web. So some of these objects are going to be ones that are on loan or a variety of different things that they may have in their museum. But up until now, tribes had no reason, no way to know that. And this provides a transparency that the tribes can then engage in that process, see if the possession or control issue was actually accurately adjudicated by the institution and potentially make a claim for it, either with the museum or whoever the other owner is. So it provides much more transparency. 
It's using definitions that have been provided in the proposal, and it just define uses a cover term that's a little bit different. And I note that um, the draft, the proposed rule actually takes a step in that direction to help deal with an issue that's long uh, been a concern of this committee regarding split collections, right. federal mm -hmm. collections that yeah. are off of federal land or are in a private institution. And some of those museums acknowledge that they're federal collections. Some of them don't. This actually provides transparency to that issue. And the, even the draft proposal identified that those museums would have to provide that information, not only to the federal agency, but also to the park service. I've added that that should be posted on the web so the tribes can see it in the first instance. And then I've expanded that here to also include the other collections that they have in their possession, using the common meaning of the term, that tribes don't know are there. So it provides much greater trans, uh, transparency and provides a tribe with, and a Native wine organization, with more opportunity to engage with the museum or the federal agency. All right, so I just wanted to explain what that, what I'm, my thought process is here. Um, I'd like to just make a, a quick comment, um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair and Tim. Um, yes. When I uh, read the uh, draft propo uh, proposed regulations, I found this section to still be confusing from just from even from the museum perspective of trying to figure out just exactly what it meant. And I think your clarification and kind of revision of the definition is, is much clearer. And, um, and I, I appreciate this because I was getting a little confused when I was going through the, the draft kind of, well, what is custody? What is possession? What is control? And, and it still was kind of confusing. So um, I appreciate you taking a taking the time to kind of re kind of define this. I think it's much easier to read and understand. You know, I, I agree as well, because it, it, you know, as Angela had aptly pointed out earlier, you know, transparency is, is important. And the revision here, uh, the proposed uh, revision here helps us to achieve that in, in this area. You know, real quick in, one of our first repatriation consultations, if the museum hadn't told us that they had sent one of the remains away 80 <laughs> years earlier to a foreign institution, we never would have known. I mean, they hold all the information, which is not to say they're necessarily aware of it, but they hold all that information. And so it starts with them. And so the ability to, to promote transparency, I think is in everyone's interest. I agree. I think sufficient interest should be defined as well. I know that was a, um, a comment made by my community that sufficient interest should be defined so that we have a, a specific um, notation that we're not looking for a higher level of evidentiary proof. Um, Angela, can you send, uh, send us a copy of, the, of your community's comments on that particular one? That would mm -hmm. be useful. Any yes, help, I, I would think? do that. Um, just a point of clarification, Angela, if, if you wanna provide that to the, to the rest of the committee members, um, you need to send it to me and, and I need to make it public. So um, I wanna be sure that you're aware that if, if you wanna submit all of, of the comments um, from your community on the proposed rule, um, you would need to send that to me so I can make it public. Okay, not just that particular definition. If you wanna send just that one, that's fine. But but I just wanted, I didn't want you to send uh, your entire comment document if, if you're not comfortable with making the entire thing public. Okay. 
I will talk to the community about that. Okay. Um, so on page 13, sacred object, I think um, Hale Aloha had highlighted that. Yeah, so, you know, the, the, it's, it, not, it was, it's an ongoing concern from the beginning that not all spiritual practices amount to organized religion. And so, and especially in, in our culture where there was an internal overthrow, if you will, of the stately religions, but the family practices maintained. I mean, it's still being done today. The prayer that I was going to offer this morning was just that. Um, and so all this is doing is, is recognizing that um, there's a need to expand the definition to also include familial um, spiritual practices because uh, museums may have items that are related to that practice. And, and I, I was just hoping that it doesn't get excluded because it doesn't amount to a, uh, a, for, a formal religion. Um, you know, we never had those terms, nor did we look at ourselves that way, but here we are. So we got to figure out how to make our lives fit into his definition. And, and the, the simple adding of uh, family spiritual practices, I'm hoping, would allow for that uh, uh, broadening of, of the definition. I don't oh, think there was any uh, disagreement with this one, but a good explanation. I think it's us to subpart B. We've been at it for almost two hours. Um, should we take a break? I need to. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. I think my dogs need me to. Uh, the coffee I've had, uh, yeah, it wants to leave. How long of a break would you like? Ten. Dr. Okay. Shinsdale said 10 minutes, so it shall be 10 minutes. Um, can, can we make it 15? <laughs> I'm, I just checked with my dogs. Can we make it 15? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. yes. Is that okay, Melanie? Yeah, of course. But however long you yes. want, I just need to know what to put on the timer. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, Faka um, um, violations here for 15 and, and all right, good. <laughs> Can we take a 15 minute break and come back? Uh, I have 750, well, I don't know what time is it there, but it's 754 here. So, we'll take 10 after the hour. 10 after. Yes. Okay, see you guys back then.
Hey, if you could please uh, uh, rejoin the meeting and turn on your cameras. <clears throat> Wonderful. We're, we're all back, ready to uh, start again. Okay. Tim, I think we're on 10.5C. Were we? Subpart B. What page? 17. Seventeen, yes. Okay. Um, I think the big one there is is one of yours. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what they wrote. <clears throat> oh, yes. Uh, it, it's actually uh, the concern I'm raising is the same concern both Dominique and Angela had spoken to earlier about um, non fairly recognized tribes and, and organizations that may assert, you know, authority in this situation. So I'm just kind of raising a similar issue that, you know, we have the same challenges here and um, adding language that's uh, the HHL has to be aware where, where a native Hawaiian organization elects to exercise these authorities, mainly because in the Hawaiian Homes program, just because you live somewhere in Hawaiian Homes doesn't mean you're from there. It just means you got a lease there and your lineal connections might be on another island. But now you're speaking for that area. And, and so, you know, just like anywhere else, there's, there's concerns and, and issues about that. So I was just raising those those issues in. Um, of course, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a former employee of the Department of Fine Homelands. I ran the multi-district office. And I believe that Hawaiian homes can be responsible in these areas, but there has to be the, the open consultation so that the department is aware when a native Hawaiian organization, uh, a homestead association asserts uh, this authority to to uh, elect to undertake uh, NACRA responsibilities. Are we okay with that section as it stands? Well, that was fast. Um, Subpart C. What page? I'm checking. Um, I think on almost seventeen. I think on twenty one. Oh. Have I missed? Have I missed one here? Oh no no twenty one. You're right. Ten okay. point ten point eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's two sections on this, um, one from yes. me and one from Dominique. Yes. But it looks like we're both agreeing. So is it okay yes. with you, Dominique, if we combine these? Yes, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, and when I do this, I'll do red line markup so that you can see where things have changed and if I didn't quite get it right. Uh, 22. Uh, um, 
this was one of my additions. It, it deals specifically with the grants program. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight here that, um, oh, we all agreed to this, didn't we? So I don't know if we need yes. to labor it. Never mind. I have 23, page 23 at the top, 10.9B3. Okay. As the next topic. Um, Dominique, do you want to discuss that one? That's one of yours. Sure. Let me also try and remember what I wrote. <laughs> I think I needed some clarification about if consultation requests are cut off at the time that notices are published. Um, let me just go back to that section. If we can all read it together, that might trigger my memory a little better. Dominique, if I if I may, I can explain this. Um, yeah, that's helpful, please. Okay. So, uh, ten point nine B three. This is in the summary requirements, and we're talking about unassociated funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Under the Act, the process uh, for consultation on summary objects uh, occurs prior to a notice. Um, and a uh, notice is based on receipt of a request for repatriation of a, one of those objects. So after a notice is published, uh, any request for from a different tribe um, would need to be made as a competing request to that initial request, uh, which is slightly different than a request to consult. Um, we quite often see this as um, a a barrier to repatriations uh, for summary objects. If a museum continues to uh, receive and mm -hmm. respond to requests to consult, but does not move forward with the repatriation to the tribe that submitted the initial request for repatriation. So we're trying to make a clear delineation here that consultation occurs up until the notice. Once a notice is published, any additional requests should be competing requests as opposed to um, consultation requests. That doesn't mean consultation can't occur and shouldn't occur if there are competing requests, that's built into the competing request process. What, what we're trying to avoid here is a situation that frequently occurs, which is where uh, another tribe that's not in the notice comes forward after notice of publication and says, we wanna consult and the entire process stops. I may be incorrect in this assumption, but is that not an important part of the publication of the notice itself? Is that the reason it's published is to inform other tribes for the purpose of initiating consultation? Um, not in the summary case. Um, that, that is um, more accurate um, when we're talking about inventories of human remains. In the case of a summary, um, we're talking about a notice that comes after a tribe has already made a request for repatriation and the museum has agreed to the repatriation, that they satisfy the criteria that they are culturally affiliated, that it is an object and, and that it should be repatriated. So we are in that window of a repatriation of an expeditious repatriation requirement for the museum. And what we're trying to do with the regulatory process is ensure that the repatriation occurs unless there are competing requests. So the purpose of a notice here is to identify a tribe that's made a request for repatriation and to allow others to come forward. That is certainly the purpose of the notice, but that's slightly different than um, uh, 
consultation, I would say. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Dominique, um, if I might suggest, can you go back and look at that section um, to see, because obviously that's not the way you interpreted it. If there's some way we can tinker with the regulatory requirement to make it more clear. Let me do some thinking and rephrasing if, if my comments still needed. Okay. I thought it's sort of related to this, but um, obviously there are strong feelings on on disposition of human remains to non-federal area recognized groups on many different sides. It's a complicated issue. Um, and I didn't raise a comment on it, didn't put a comment on it, but my understanding I, under the current regulations if a museum or a federal agency intends to have a disposition of what's currently identified as culturally unidentifiable human remains to a non-federally recognized group, they're required to come, they're required to get a recommendation from the secretary to proceed. And that has typically gone through this committee. Under the current regs or the proposed regs, that is changed so that they don't need to come to the committee or get a recommendation from the secretary anymore. They just work it out with the museum. And then the only notification, formal notification they receive would be when the notice is published. Is that accurate, Melanie? Um, that is accurate, but only for those human remains that have no geographic location. So this would not apply to the majority of <laughs> identifiable human remains that have a geographical location. This would only pertain to uh, what is roughly about 5% of the human remains that have been reported under NAGPRA that have no geographical information. Thanks. Um, I guess my question to the committee is on that 5% where there is no cultural affiliation, no geographical affiliation, but that the museum decides they want to proceed with a disposition to a non-federally recognized group, should they be allowed to proceed without coming to the department? So I think this committee um, in hearing those provides some level of oversight and transparency on what the museum is trying to do. And ultimately the yeah. decision for them to proceed is not just the museum official deciding, but is the department deciding. <clears throat> and is that something that you would, the people that are concerned about these dispositions would want to retain or not? Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Tim, um, you know, maybe it would be uh, uh, a consideration that the museum and or university, even the federal agency, um, to make that kind of a call would need to have, I guess, some built-in options in the event, as an example, Tim, 
if there are a, a set of human remains or ancestral remains that can't be associated or culturally affiliated or even geographic, there's a potential that we could be giving some discretion to museum or university in the event that the ancestral remains are ancient. And of course, ancient remains, that is another, it's another ball game. So I would be, that would be my concern, Tim, to in there would there needs to be discretion that can be determined on if a museum can do that but I, that that would be my concern tim thank you well if i might ask yeah I, I, oh go ahead Teddy. no I, I was just going to say I, I i share that concern and so the idea of the committee exercising oversight in situations such as that, I think, is a prudent idea that should be included in, in the rules. Um, just so that you know, the concerns that Angela and Dominique had discussed earlier, um, you know, they're, they're in case there are groups coming forward that are doing this for recognition purposes, um, that we are able to um, provide some guidance. Um, Having said that, I, I, I participated a few years ago. Um, it was a museum in Denver that made a proposal for um, culturally unidentifiable remains, but they requested the museum to allow them with the concurrence of Native Hawaiian organizations and federally recognized tribes to, our, our term is Hanai, to adopt these ancestors and, and have them reinterred on their reservation. And I believe it went through because they held a in-person consultation and flew people in from all over the US to consult. But the point is there was open mm -hmm. consultation and the decision wasn't made uh, irrespective of that. And I think that was a situation that, that worked really well. Um, can I ask you, Dominique, I know that um, you've raised the issue of non-federally recognized groups several times. Is, do you think that that's something that the department should exercise oversight on? Yes, yes, they definitely do. I don't necessarily think that museums or universities have that kind of specialized knowledge to be able to make that determination on their own, um, as well-meaning as they may be. And I think having that oversight here with the department, with the committee, and also in consultation with the federally recognized tribes, and hopefully in partnership. I really like that idea. I think it, it works very effectively, you know, to be able to make those transitions if necessary. Um, that's probably a procedural section that we would have to add here. Um, is there a volunteer to take a crack at that? I can take a look at it. Thanks. Yeah, I agree that needs to be ad added in, again, for transparency's sake, so that we know um, what is happening and who's making that determination. And that someone with the appropriate cultural knowledge is um, providing input in that it isn't just a, a means to um, finishing that case. I think acknowledging what uh, Melanie said, that this is likely to, to occur relatively infrequently, but I think maybe it'd be good to exercise some oversight on that. Uh, 
uh, page 24, 10.11 civil penalties. I have marked that. Did I mark it incorrectly? <laughs> Oh, uh, you, you did. It was for purposes of us having a uh, further discussion, right? Because they are, um, you know, this this is a especially critical uh, uh, issue to me, just because the last thirty years has taught us that there, are, the majority of the museums and and agencies are really good folks who are committed to complying with the law. And then there are others. And this is designed to get the others to comply. So here, here's one very serious problem. Um, and that is, I don't know if, you know, if, if well, the problem is when museums uh, piecemeal repatriations, some of these institutions are so large and their collections are so vast that they just miss remains. So the first time that happens, understandable. Second time it happens, uh, shots, okay, understandable. But the fifth time it happens, not so understandable. Um, and so unless there's some kind of mechanism you know, a hammer, if you will. Uh, I just fear that that's going to continue. And and for us, the the you know, like like Armin correctly said, you know, the greatest teacher here is real is experience. And experience has taught us that you know, if there's nothing holding, uh, I mean, that's over these museums to comply completely, they're going to just keep doing this. And so for us, a repatriation we did thirty years ago to have remains associated with those individuals now uh, being made available for repatriation, but we already reburied them and we already sealed those caves and we're already, like, it's done. And now we have to deal with the heaviness of that fallout, us, not the museum. And so uh, in the interest of fairness, I really think that this is uh, an area that this committee needs to really um, emphasize with the Park Service that it needs to be uh, uh, improved, shored up. You know, I think we submitted 10 or 11 um, requests for, for investigations. Only one of them was able, ever followed through and it resulted in the finding of the museum. Um, this museum was repeatedly doing this, and but only in one instance where they actually find for this, uh, you know, misbehavior. So, I, I, I ask you to all join me in in, in really um, us having one voice with regard to the importance of emphasizing the need for uh, improvement of of civil penalties. And, and and investigations by the, the, the Park Service into these cases, some of which involve other parks, which creates an interesting scenario. Um, so, yeah, we really need to. I mean, we're thirty three years in. We 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 need to tighten this up. A end of speech. Sorry. <laughs> I agree with you completely, and I support that. I My comment specifically addresses civil penalties, which I know the government's not going to fine itself, but looking at federal agencies, noncompliance, so, you know, Park Service, you know, those big collection holders and those big federal land holders who are not following the regs pretty much, um, you know, as a rule of thumb. So. I feel like there's no outlet right now for complaints um, to have them investigated and to have some sort of accountability sort of built in and to follow that process, I, I think would be very beneficial.
Dominic, can I take a crack at writing something there and send it to you to see if it's adequate? Absolutely. Thanks. Ooh. And if I might suggest, um, you know, it's hard when you're dealing with the federal government kind of policing itself, but I think training might be a good place to start if it's possible to suggest that. Um, you know, we just see people within the department who, who don't know the process and it's very hard to have to teach it, you know, from this side to people who are supposed to be implementing it. It's very time consuming. I think also that this is uh, this raises funding issues for the, the, the National NACRA program to make sure that they have a team of investigators. I remember back in the day, I remember there was this one guy <laughs> and he was overwhelmed. <laughs> um, and so I think there needs to be uh, support for, for a funding increase to be able to, you know, boots on the ground, implement, I mean, conduct these investigations and um, enforce the law. I agree with that. I've always thought that the agencies were underfunded, especially because they're not allowed to um, seek granting, grant funding. And then, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be addressed. I think the GAO has already identified that uh, agencies have been underfunded in terms of the collections provisions of the statute. Uh, and the report to Congress asks them to do a similar look at uh, the excavation and discovery provisions, which have not been looked at before. So hopefully we'll get better information out of GAO. Uh, Dominic, I think your point of um, ha you know, having the ability to report anonymously is really important um, because I think, um, you know, if if a federal employee is working for an agency that's not in compliance, is not going to um, feel comfortable reporting if they have to provide their name and, and address and, and all that information. And I think that's really important. I would say the same thing for museum employees um, and university uh, museum employees that um, are seeing things that are not being um, done correctly and that that their institution is not in compliance and having that ability as well to, to be able to report anonymously. I think that's a really important aspect. So thank you for including that. Yes, thank you. I agree. Uh, page 28. Um, the the um, pro the preamble to the proposed or to the proposed rule asks these four specific questions that I've uh, put something in on. I wanted to sort of highlight the last one. They specifically ask for how the agency might minimize minimize the burden of collection of information, and I think given that the rule is proposing a systematic way of dealing with geographical affiliation based on treaties and other types of documentation, that it seems reasonable that, that there would be a central point to identify that information. And the logical place for that to be is with the Department of the Interior administered by the secretary. <laughs> And that would ease the burden on museums and federal agencies because there would be a single point where they could go and identify the Aboriginal land of particular tribes for a particular location, and they would be able to rely upon it. And that would cut out the need for them to have expensive lawyers to look through all of these documents 
to do all the historical research themselves. The department is the logical place to do that, obviously in full consultation with all of the relevant federally recognized tribes, because these treaties and other documents are between those two parties. So it's logical that those two parties would come together to identify them. I just wanted to make sure that that's something that people are okay with. Um, but I think it would be a way to ease the burden on museums and federal agencies to have to go do this work themselves. But I also think that it would ensure uh, the reliability and the uniformity of how these are being interpreted. I think, uh, Tim, this would be very helpful to museums um, in particular, but I also think with tribes, but museums to have a central place to go when they're, when they're trying to do the documentation of their collections and working in consultation as well. So then they have, you know, something that they can, um, you know, point to as well in terms of making some of the determinations and consultations with tribes. So I think having a central clearinghouse with all of these documents would be very helpful. Just a question, who would be responsible for maintaining it? Because I think I've seen websites and, and maybe they're federally sponsored in the past that have kind of endeavored to do something like this. And they always seem to be very out of date and very wrong. Um, that's kind of the issue that I've always, I've always seen. You go to them and you kind of look at a tribe's Aboriginal territory or who the contacts are, and they are, you know, 15 years out of date. So, how do you avoid sort of bad information? How do you make sure that it stays up to date? You know, who's the latest typo? Things like that. Um. That I mean, a that's, a, that's a real point. Um, what do you suggest? Obviously, I think having, a, having such a thing uh, administered by a non-governmental entity, by a nonprofit or some other kind of thing, has lots of problems with it because you don't know if that organization is going to be around in five or ten years. So okay. I think logically... It's the government, and I think it probably should be the Department of the Interior because of the responsibility for the statute. Now, how to make sure that the department keeps it up to date is another issue. Um, I think a similar, a similar uh, type of activity is the uh, listing that is required by statute for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to come out with a list of federally recognized tribes each year. So maybe updating each year is something we could add here as a regulatory requirement. I think that's a good start. Is, is each year good enough? I believe so. Otherwise, it becomes burdensome. Yeah. yeah. I think you'd struggle to get engagement more frequently than one year. Right. Okay. I also think there needs to be funding for training on all of these things so that there isn't um, a, there aren't tools, but no one's using them. I mean, there's tools, but no one's using them. I think there should be personnel funding because um, if you start adding up all the things we're asking, uh, there's you probably want dedicated staff doing this um, gathering of information and maintaining uh, the information. Um, otherwise, we're just drowning the National Plan for Program um, in, response, in these responsibilities. Just something to think about. I can add something in there about funding. Yeah, about I think it has to go hand in hand. Oh. Uh, and with that, um, Mr. Chair, I believe I have finished.
so um, I think we have our assignments now for what uh, we need to follow up with uh, Tim in terms of um, the, the different sections that we want to, um, uh, that we need to either compile, uh, consolidate language or clarify it or, or in my case, remove a lot of, a lot of it and then uh, get those comments in to uh, Tim um, by when, Tim? Look, We're gonna deal with the Congress report first, right? No, I think we have to do them at both at the same time. Oh, gotcha. Oh, so this Sunday, same? Um, it'd be better if you could get me comments on Saturday. Can you ruin your weekend? Eh. <laughs> my wife's on my wife's on travel, so it's just me in the pack right now. <laughs> okay, I could do that. Um, is that is that time frame work for everyone? I would please ask that we uh, because we at the next meeting, right? That's our other opportunity to to get this done. So right. Uh, if I can ask, uh, and I think this is for you um, as chair, what format would you like this to look? Would this be a letter from you? Excuse me. Or would it be like an attachment with the kind of header that we have here? I don't know. My, my, my sense is the latter um, because it needs to reflect the, uh, the involvement of the entire committee. But... Melanie, can you guide us on this in terms of format? Sure. Um, I think that the format you have here is sufficient. Um, I, I think that what is necessary um, is probably to remove the attributions um, from the document. If this is going to be the recommendations of the entire committee, uh, then they yeah. need to not have those attributions. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. And if um, if I might um, suggest, when I go through this, I'll do red line strikeout. So I'll take out, I'll strike out your name, but that, but it'll still be there so you can see it on the next iteration. And I'll try to go through where there's sort of a first person presentation. I'll change it into a we, the, you know, the committee recommends. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. But this general format is okay, kind of going from section to section and okay. I think so, because it's okay. uh it's linear and it's easy to follow. I have my task before me. Thank you so much. Uh Melanie, next on our oh, I'm sorry, is that all uh comments on this particular section? Uh agenda item? Okay, um, the next item on your agenda is uh, opportunity for public comment. Um, every meeting of the review committee includes time for public comment as is required under FACA. If you're interested in providing public comment during this meeting or at future meetings, please raise your hand or send a chat to make a request to make public comment. The review committee can also accept written comment. Um, I did receive written comment uh, that I wanted to share with you at this time while we're waiting for others to raise their hand or make a comment in the chat. This written comment comes from Jane Lee Thomas of uh, Indiana University. Dear esteemed review committee members, my name is Dr. Jane Lee Thomas, and I'm the director of the Office of Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act at the Indiana University. In the summer of 2021, it was announced the fall 2021 review committee meeting would be held in Bloomington, Indiana, co-hosted by the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Indiana University. Because of COVID-related travel restrictions, this meeting was postponed. The Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Indiana University have developed an exceptionally strong partnership, and at this time, I would like to reissue our, offer, our joint offer of co-hosting your next in-person meeting at Indiana University's campus. 
We sincerely thank you for your consideration. Okay, I um, think we have one um, request to comment. Uh, Jackie Cook, you may unmute. Thank you. Um, I'll read this so I don't get uh, distracted. Greetings and Happy New Year. I'm Jackie Cook, Repatriation Specialist for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. I'm a Piscosa or Wenatchee woman and have been in this position for over 20 years. To the review committee, welcome to the new members and returning member Armin Minthorn. Thank you for allowing time for public comment regarding the progress of the review of the proposed changes to NAGPRA regulations. As stated in the past consultation and listening sessions, Colville has a number of concerns and I will briefly mention a few of those for the new and returning members. Colville will be submitting written comments. One of the most persistent concerns we have is the short timeline for the review of the proposed changes to the regulations. The proposed changes will impact not only tribes, but other institutions as well. The pro proposed changes are lengthy. These changes needed to be reviewed, considered and discussed by not only technical program policy, but elders and religious leaders as well. Additionally, we feel that consultation has not been brought enough throughout the tribes in either 2021 or 22, 23. A request for additional 30 days had been made and would have allowed for more tribal voices to be heard. Not only did this review period fall in the middle of a busy national holiday season, but for many times, for, for many tribes, not this time of year begins our ceremonial uh, year. With approximately six working days along with another federal holiday remaining, we can only assume the extension of the comment time will not be granted. We are concerned with some of the changes in language and procedures regarding consultation. Consultation takes as long as consultation takes. NAGPRA, NAGPRA begins with good consultation and it takes it to the conclusion of repatriation, but it also builds relationships that extend beyond a single or multiple repatriation. No tribe should be required to, cons to request to consult in writing. If a written record and or a clock started are needed, then language should reflect that both parties mutually agree to consult. Calvo also feels the proposed regulations, if the proposed regulations are approved as written, will be a missed opportunity to assist in the repatriation of sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. The summaries submitted in 1993 should be updated in addition to the inventories. Colville has worked and included non-federally recognized tribes in many, many repatriations. In 2012, the Columbia Plateau Intertribal Repatriation Group supported the disposition of ancestral remains to the Wanapum Band of Priest Rapids. We have close cultural and family ties with non-federally recognized tribes we will continue the pra this practice of working with non-federally recognized tribes. Lastly, overall, the preamble is overly lengthy, confusing, and has uh, convoluted examples. This section should clearly represent the comments of all those submitting comments. We, again, we will be providing written comments and this con concludes this, this brief uh, uh, comment. So Lam Lam Kitsiaya, thank you for in letting me into this agenda. Thank you.
Um, we have uh, two comments in the chat, which I will read into the record. Uh, the first is from Miranda Panther with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. We agree with Dominique and Angelina and Angela, sorry, <laughs> in regards to the involvement of state recognized tribes. The existing law allows for them to consulted if needed. I'm in the Southeast. We have a significant um, issue with state recognized tribes or tribal groups attempting to use involvement with NAGPRA to legitimize their quest for recognition. The next uh, written comment in the chat is from Honor Keeler. This question goes to National NAGPRA Program and the Review Committee. How will the proposed changes in the regulations be affected by the STOP Act, which has just been passed by Congress and signed into law by the President of the United States? Will additional changes be made to the regulations? If these are added, will the process begin again or go through consultation process and review by the Review Committee? Thank you. Can I, can I get a clarification? Uh, in this part of the meeting, when we're accepting um, public comment and written, are we able to discuss the comments? Yes, certainly. But I would like to respond to Honor Keeler's comment and suggest that we create a subcommittee to uh, address the the concerns, the, the issue that she's raising with, with regard to the STOP Act. Um, and, and appoint Dr. McEwen, no, I'm just kidding, to, uh, to lead that subgroup, uh, subcommittee, sorry, or anyone else. If, if I might uh, weigh in on this question. Um, please, please. Certainly, um, the STOP Act uh, is under consideration by the Department of the Interior and the Secretary of the Interior, who has a number of responsibilities under the Act itself. Um, the Review Committee does have some responsibilities in um, working with the committees and working groups that are created by the STOP Act, uh, but the, the Review Committee itself does not have a role in implementing the STOP Act. Uh, nor uh, does the STOP Act uh, amend or alter NAGPRA. So therefore, I feel at this time, it, it is, um, it's not a, a valid or a, a useful process for the, the committee itself to engage in an analysis of the STOP Act. Certainly, each of you individually are welcome to read the STOP Act, really read the related um, information to start to um, pull apart the pieces of this, but at this time, uh, the work involved with the STOP Act is with the secretary and, and with the department to figure out how it's going to carry out these responsibilities that Congress has given. So are, are you saying that the STOP Act and its impacts is outside of the scope of NAGPRA? Um, yes, it is. Hmm. I thought there was some overlap. Um, there is an overlap when it comes to criminal penalties. Um, that is a, a change in NAGPRA, but that is the extent of that change. And perhaps that would be the area that we would um, like to comment on or, or provide oversight and, and advice to the secretary on? Um, I think that uh, at this time, I, I, I would uh, I want the committee to to wait for uh, the Secretary of the Interior to ask for your input uh, on um, the the process. I think there's a lot of issues that need to be worked out um, with the Stop Act and the requirements of the Stop Act um, before the the committee weighs in on that. In terms of the overlap with NAGPRA on the criminal provisions, uh, the Stop Act merely increases. Um, the the penalties for criminal activity. So, um, and that is now law. 
So there's not much input uh, that can be given at this time um, on, on those, the change to NAGPRA in, in that way. Um, there's a follow-up from Honor Keeler in the chat that seems that uh, it seems to her there is a significant overlap with NAGPRA and it would be good to form a subcommittee within the review committee. I, again, at this time, I, I don't feel that that is a, um, a valuable use of your time until you have more direction from the secretary. I, I guarantee that the secretary and the department are going to need information and input from this review committee as they work out how to administer the STOP Act. But uh, STOP Act specifically excludes in its text um, that repatriations that are required under NAGPRA are required under NAGPRA, and they're not uh, a part of, of what is being required under the STOP Act. Sorry, I don't mean to belabor the point, but I want to direct a question to Dr. McEwen. Um, in the past, has the review committee weighed in on laws outside of NAGPRA, such as the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which I re recall reading some something somewhere where the committee made a recommendation on it. Um, and well, do, do you recall that? I'm sure. Uh, there's a number of the reports to Congress that the committee has done in the past where they've um, they recommended the uh, amendment to the National Museum of the American Indian Act that added um, uh, unassociated funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony to the mandate uh, for repatriation. Um, even last year, we recommended that Congress pass the Stop Act. Uh, I I sympathize with Melanie's point on this one. There's really nothing for us to do today on this. However, I don't think it would be a bad idea to establish a subcommittee not to do anything, but to be ready to do something in between meetings, because that's sort of the issue. Um, subcommittees can meet outside of these meetings to do preliminary and preparatory work. And at some point, um, <clears throat> my understanding is that the STOP Act, um, as of the day of passage, prohibited export of these kinds of objects without a permit. That's the law. And at this particular moment, there's no mechanism for issuing permits. So you can't do the export now. <clears throat> I do think that there will be pressure from the art community to make sure that the permits get done in a timely, get created in a timely fashion. And when that's done, the advisory committee that is separate advisory committee that is established under the Stock Act, Stop Act has a specific um, ability to consult with this committee. And if that happens in between our meetings, it would probably be useful to have somebody, a group of people that could draft some documents or collect information that then would allow this committee in its actual de public deliberations to make some decisions. So I think there is a value to have a, some people that could start that process when they're asked. Um, but I agree with Melanie. I don't think it's a thing that we need to sit down and start analyzing the STOP Act. Thank you. I think we'll get plenty of information about how the secretary interprets the responsibility, hopefully sooner rather than later. And, and again, I would, um, uh, I would stress that that when the secretary provides that information, um, it will be to the committee as a whole, um, and it will be in the course of a public meeting, and that would be the appropriate time at which to form a subcommittee. I would also remind you that you are missing one member of the committee, and um, it might be beneficial uh, to pause this discussion until there is a request from the secretary or from the working group that's established by the STOP Act. That's the responsibility of this committee is, is to respond to the secretary or that working group. Um, and at this time, 
um, there is no such request. If a request were to come in between now and, and the next meeting that um, we determine for the committee, um, we could uh, find ways of, of dealing with that and sharing information um, with all of you so that you're prepared to um, respond in that next public meeting. Um, but I, again, I, I just want to stress that I don't see a value for a subcommittee at this time. I, I think that there will be a value for that in the future, uh, especially okay. if there are continued requests from either that working group or the secretary, um, but we're not there yet. Thank you for that. Um, I believe Honor uh, uh, added a, another comment. If you could read it into the record, please. These are important, sorry, the comment from Honor Keeler is, these are important issues to include within reports to Congress. It is especially important because of the significant links between collections of our ancestors and cultural items in the United States and overseas which include federal agencies and follow up on federal permits, which may help our ancestors and cultural items come home from overseas. Thank you. Are, are there further comments from, uh, from the public? At this time, I do not see any hands raised or um, comments in the chat. If you would like to make a comment, you're welcome to raise your hand or put your name into the chat and I will call on you. Uh, at this time, I do not see any other hands raised or, or comments. Um, ooh, I see a hand. Um, yes, Tim. I know that we are kind of in the midst of finalizing the FY 2022 report to Congress. And um, we're sort you know, Shelby and I are sort of the last vestiges of the people on that. Uh, but I would like to propose the, the report to Congress subcommittee is actually a standing committee of this committee. Uh, and I would like to propose that we solicit um, nominations or uh, volunteers to participate in the subcommittee on the Fisk on the uh, report to Congress for FY 2023. I'd be glad to help with that, Tim. Uh, just uh, clarification, is, is the chair allowed to serve on these committees? Subcommittee, sorry. Um, yes, that is generally up to the chair's uh, discretion, but yes. Okay, then I would like to be on the uh, subcommittee for FY 2023 report to Congress. And I'll volunteer. And I will volunteer as well to be on the uh, FY 2023 subcommittee for the report to Congress. May I just step back a minute and, and clarify, as, as Tim mentioned, it is a standing committee, so it's not specific to a certain year, which means, Tim and Shelby, that you are still members of this subcommittee and, and until you choose not to be. Um, so what we're looking for here are additional members to the subcommittee. And, and this was an intentional change in the way the subcommittee was structured uh, several years ago so that there would always be a standing committee we wouldn't need to go through this process each time so I, I just wanted to clarify we're not establishing a new subcommittee specifically for the 23 report but we are is adding to the standing committee so uh, with that we'll add um holly aloha dominique to this subcommittee and angela to congress and angela and yeah you have yeah. okay
Are there any other administrative matters that we need to discuss at this time, uh, Melanie? Um, yes, if, if I might. Um, the committee had asked me to include in your discussion today um, a discussion of upcoming meeting locations, uh, preliminary okay. discussions. Um, during the January 10th meeting next week, uh, the review committee uh, will need to discuss and make recommendations to me about possible meeting locations for an in-person meeting of the review committee in late spring or early summer of 2023. Uh, we heard a written comment from Jane Lee Thomas of Indiana University that you have a joint invitation from the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Indiana University to meet in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, with the time uh, uh, remaining, or, or less than that, I, I would hope, um, uh, there is an opportunity for some discussion on that issue, but it, again, we'll, we'll look forward to a, a final uh, recommendation at your next meeting, unless you're prepared today to come up with a, a list of recommendations. What we need from the committee is an identification of, of one or more locations, cities, areas generally, but, but specific cities that we can then work to identify uh, appropriate um, venues and, and from that then dates. Um, so we're looking for uh, locations from, from you all this time. I would like to start by thanking the, the, the woman from Indiana University for the invitation. Um, and just to uh, share that, you know, it was a it was a previous invitation that the community had agreed to that was interfered with by COVID. So I would like us to give careful consideration to honoring that um, that commitment and and at some point in time uh, consider going to uh, Indiana University as the venue uh, with the uh, Miami Tribe of Oklahoma um, and and honor that that previous agreement. Melanie, I know um, some many years ago, we actually tried to think about more than just the next meeting, but several meetings ahead so that to provide the program with adequate time to think things through. Um, I would like to recommend that the committee consider holding a meeting at, uh, at Berkeley, California to specifically uh, hear presentations um, from the universe, the Hearst Museum, the University of California, Berkeley, the uh, University of California system, the California State University system, and the Native American Heritage Commission regarding implementation of NAGPRA and any issues that may be arising from conflicts between the federal law and the California um, Native American Grace Protection Repatriation Act. Uh, I support that as well. Um, are there any other uh, venues that, that people have in mind? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> you know, just from memory, Tim, uh, you know, recently, uh, U.S. or U.C. Berkeley, they don't have a very good track record in working with tribes. Mm -hmm. And maybe that has begun to change, but that needs to be demonstrated by Berkeley themselves. But um, knowing they do not have a good track record in working with tribes, that's a fact. Um, Again, we would put up uh, the Southwest for consideration for an in-person meeting. Thank you.
uh, Melanie, if you could clarify how many meetings uh, will be scheduled in uh, calendar year 2023? Oh, no, I guess it's we're on the federal calendar. Um, yes, that our, our so, budget for your meetings is, is on the federal calendar, which would end September 30th, 2023. Right. However, that right. doesn't prevent us from looking ahead to possible options right. for fiscal year. Um, and, and we can certainly do that. Um, I obviously, we're most interested in establishing your next meeting um, and, and getting a start on that, but we can also continue then to prepare for a additional meeting after that. We are, um, as you all know, um, we are in a state of adjustment in trying to identify what the new normal is um, in, in, our, in terms of our, um, our meeting schedule. So it, it used to be that we would try to schedule two in-person meetings every fiscal year. Um, I, um, I would seek the committee's input on whether that is the preferred um, uh, resumption of activities that we, we look at two in-person meetings every fiscal year. Um, I would consider these two meetings um, to equate to a, at least part of a in-person meeting in, in terms of the hours that you're spending. Um, so whether or not we would try to include two in-person meetings before September 30th, um, that, that, would, uh, that would take some effort, I think, on all of our parts to ensure that the time and the scheduling for that. However, it, we could look ahead to the fiscal year 24 in scheduling two in-person meetings, maybe one in the fall, which was our typical um, pattern, one in the fall and, and one in the spring. So I would like us to consider the two choices that were um, uh, uh, recommended. Um, Indiana University, uh, um, University of California, Berkeley, with uh, the third choice being for fiscal year 2024 to be uh, a venue in the Southwest as um, uh, Mr. Minthorn had, had recommended as well. I agree, those are really good suggestions. Um, one thing I think we should think about is the weather <laughs> in those areas within the time that we're planning to have these meetings. I had the same thought. You know, I look outside and the weather looks the same every day. <laughs> and it's not, the volcano's not erupting, so it's pretty steep now. <laughs> Are you saying we could have a meeting in Hawaii somewhere? <laughs> we could definitely have a meeting on the island of Hawaii. It's safe uh. now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I suspect we don't want to go to Indiana in this. Oh, no. I, I think Melanie yeah. said early spring, he said? Yes. So it should, it should be nice by then. Yeah. Actually, we're looking at late spring or early summer. Oh, late spring. That's even better. Yeah. yeah. Angela, maybe you and I can put our heads together about uh, a possible venue in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Come up with a plan, an idea. And um, just for those of, uh, of you on the committee, as, as well as those in attendance, I will remind everyone that our, our goal will be to always have an option for uh, remote um, viewing of these meetings. Um, even if they're held in person, we have, uh, we've been working on that prior to COVID and, and plan to continue to be able to broadcast these meetings, uh, even when they're held in person. It is unclear at this time what the participation options will be for remote attendees, but we will certainly have uh, an option for remote viewing of these um, proceedings. Okay, if, if there's no other discussion on meetings. 
Um, there are no other agenda items. Um, you do have about 40 minutes left. Uh, if the committee would like to take up any other uh, discussions or, or business before we adjourn. Members, are there any concerns that you wish to raise for us to collectively uh, discuss before we adjourn? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes, yes Simon. Um, would like to put on the table consideration for future agenda items for the committee. Um, federal agencies, they need to, we need to hear from them directly. And as an example, Bureau of Land Management, they're one of the worst federal agencies in complying with NAGPRA. The other is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They are probably the worst of all of them in complying with NAGPRA. And the big concern with the Bureau is the storage. A very large number of human remains, undocumented, and they're at risk of leaving the collections because they are undocumented. And it would seem the Bureau of Indian Affairs would be an example for complying with NAGPRA, but they are not. They are the worst in complying with NAGPRA. So federal agencies would like to put that on the agenda for consideration for future meeting or meetings. Also, um, last item is international repatriation. We have a neighbor right to the north of us, Canada. They have everything up there. Ancestral remains, cultural items, culturally identifiable human remains, sacred items, items of cultural patrimony. They have all of those up there. It would be good to have that discussion. How can we begin that? How can we start that relationship with Canada? They don't comply with NAGPRA like we do. However, what they have in their museums and universities is unbelievable. And it would be a worthwhile consideration for this committee on how we can approach that uh, situation with Canada. So just put those items up for consideration with the committee. And again, finally, to hear directly from federal agencies, that needs to be regular. That has to happen regularly in, with federal agencies. So thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Armin. Um, Melanie, when the agenda is set for our meetings, are, is that set by us or is that set by you? How, how, how does that work? Because I want to, uh, I, I support um, Armin's um, uh, comments, um, especially with regard to um, having interaction with, with federal agencies. I think that's that would be near the top of my list too. Um, the international repatriation one, I think we got to discuss a little bit more because I suspect uh, Brady and Steven 
just perked up in their chairs. Um, so let's take the first one, the, the federal agencies. Can yeah, we certainly. begin um, to include those? Uh, absolutely, the, the agenda is set by us collectively. Um, and so that includes uh, individual members of the committee that, that wish to um, identify issues for an agenda. Uh, but certainly prior to setting an agenda, um, it is my responsibility to, to work with the chair um, on what is in the agenda. Uh, the, the, the program also receives requests uh, for disposition or findings of fact. Um, and so those would be part of what we would contribute to your agenda, again, in, in consultation with the chair of the committee. Um, so uh, the agenda is, is, there are lots of options for you and, and for your agenda. Um, in the past, the review committee has requested that the program specifically send invitations to federal agencies on your behalf. Um, and we'd be happy to resume that um, and, and do so and invite federal agencies to come in and give you presentations. Excellent. Um, so we, we, we could work on that. Um, and then with regard to the second matter? Yes, with regard to international repatriation, uh, again, it is um, somewhat out of the scope uh, of NAGPRA generally. There's no... Um, application of NAGPRA beyond the, the U.S. borders, uh, except where um, there is some um, museum or federal agency that might have control of that collection that resides outside of, of the United States. Um, however, that doesn't prevent the committee from hearing from um, individuals or, or experts or uh, making invitations um, for presentations on these issues. So I just wanted to make the following comment that, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Brady, excuse me. I, I just wanted to add briefly to that, that um, in uh, inviting folks to speak to issues, maybe specifically related to Canada as an example, um, uh, certainly private institutions or, um, or, 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 or private museums that exist up there, um, they might have information that relates to collections that are even split between the countries where there, there might actually be a tie to uh, collections that are subject to NAGPRA. Those would be good opportunities for you to gather information on what that means, what that's like. In the cases where you may want information from a foreign government, uh, we'd first have to check in with the State Department on how we would go about doing that. So I just want to set expectations on that up front uh, before we, we think through uh, how we're engaging with, with a foreign entity. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Um, and it's good to hear from Brady. No venture, no gain. Uh, and one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um I think Brady addressed what I, what, what I was going to say. I, I was just going to make the comment that, you know, for Native Hawaiians, we view all NAGPRA repatriations as international, you know, between our country and the United States. Um, but I understand that, uh, uh, I, I, I just hope that we can keep exploring having the sharing of information and, and the review committee being the forum for that, uh, so that those tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations that are seeking of, of the United States and NAGPRA, uh, may, uh, can gain inspiration and, and information on how the Cambridge University, one of the rec repatriation requirements is the application, uh, uh, is the question whether if the, the repatriation request that you're making to Cambridge was occurring in your host country, what would the laws of their host country say? Which means that in, in the case we did there, we got to apply NAGPRA, at least in theory, in England to demonstrate that the NACPA process would have called for repatriation. And, and that weighed into the, the university's decision to repatriate. Um, so, so, you know, my point being, if when you have these discussions, uh, you start gaining insight into how things are really working. In, in Hawaiian, we say makahana kaike, it means knowing by doing. You're not gonna ever know unless you engage which is, I think, what, what 
Armin is sharing with us. So mahalo for that. Um, are there any other um, administrative matters that we need to discuss? <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Melanie, a question for you. So, so today is our 83rd meeting. Next week will be our 84th meeting. So is there a, I guess a time frame or a rough time frame for um, the 86th meeting? Um, so 85th and then 86th? Yes. Um, yes, well, as we discussed, we're, we need to figure out what the new calendar looks like. Uh, we certainly do want to try to plan for another meeting later this year um, in in late spring or early summer. That would be the 85th meeting. For the 86th meeting, um, I, th I think it may be difficult and, to try to schedule that before September 30th. And there may be advantages to scheduling it after September 30th so that you have can complete your report to Congress at that time after the end of the fiscal year. So I would suggest that the 86th meeting be scheduled sometime in the fall of 23. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, are there any other matters that we need to discuss? Uh, having heard on uh, Melanie, um, so we're going to receive emails from Lisa on materials for next week once we get all of our comments into Tim and Shelby. Um, and then the 10th, right? Next, that's next Tuesday. I'm sorry, what, what's the start time for that one? Sure. Same? The, the next meeting will be Tuesday, January 10th, beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern. Oh. Oh, good. <laughs> I had to count on my fingers. That's nine o'clock our time. Thank you. This uh, new new chairman really appreciates the start time. Okay. Um, last call, anyone? Or anyone in, in, in the public who wants to comment? Um, having heard none, um, Melanie, am I, uh, is it okay to now end the meeting? Uh, absolutely. Um, we can uh, adjourn the meeting together. Uh, I would ask that uh, I give the closing prayer to end the meeting. Um, 